We're here in Santa Barbara Zoo today with Chef Trent at Redley Tree Animal Kitchen. We're going to be show you, showing you some prep food and answer some of the questions you submitted to us previous to this broadcast and possibly if there's any other additional questions we'll try to answer today. My name is Eliza. I'm Missouri's Regional Manager. And Trent, what's your role here at the Zoo? Hi everybody, I am Chef Trent, as they like to call me here. I am the animal nutritionist here at the Santa Barbara Zoo. Very well. Trent and I work together to deliver healthy and balanced diets to the animals here at Santa Barbara Zoo. In fact, many of our diets that you see today here in the kitchen were developed to be a solution to some of the challenges uh, faced in kitchens and commissaries and zoos and aquariums. So Trent's feedback uh, is key for Missouri. I'm sorry. No, uh, definitely going off of that. Um, here at the Santa Barbara Zoo, we are very proud to help um, you know feature some of the Missouri products in the about 275 diets that we prepare every single day for our animals here. Uh, that represents about 115 different species of animals, putting us about 550 animals. Last time I counted. Wow. Well. And um, Missouri's goal is really to develop um, diets that provide health to the animals and promote their longevity. Trent, what are the, the um, keys and, and projects and, and things you do here at the zoo that meet these similar goals? Um, well, there's quite a bit of uh, nutrition that's going to come and play here at the zoo when it comes to our animals. As I mentioned, we have to feed about 115 different species of animals. Each of those animals are going to have different nutritional requirements, and that's where our partnership with Missouri comes in, developing, um, well, basically providing feedback based on nutritional needs, scientific research for some of these animals' requirements, and that's where Missouri and the zoos get our great partnership, is our, basically, as I mentioned, our, our close relationship on being able to say what our needs are for the industry and helping uh, formulate some of these new diets. Well, so this is the part that we've been waiting for to look uh, a little bit deep into food preparation here at Bradley Tree Animal Kitchen. Yeah. Trent, where do we begin? Sure. Um, one of the diets I was going to showcase for you guys at home watching us here on the, uh, our Facebook Live feed is uh, one of our, our diets for our rhinoceros hornbill. Uh, if those aren't familiar with rhinoceros hornbills, it's a rather large sized bird that's found in Southeast Asia. These are an endangered species. Uh, we have a, a pair of them here at the Santa Barbara Zoo, and um, we went ahead and did a little bit pre-preparation for some of these diets, just to make it a little bit easier, kind of like you would see at your uh, cooking show and your favorite uh, cooking show and whatnot. Uh, so the main components of the rhinoceros hornbill diets are primarily fruits. Here at the zoo, we use only um, we try to use locally sourced fruits whenever possible, but of course some of these fruits might not be available, such as papayas, which we do not grow in Santa Barbara. But this diet is going to contain mostly different fruit items, whether it's uh, papaya, a little bit of grapes, melon. So obviously you can tell rhinoceros hornbill is primarily what we call a frugivore, a fruit eating animal. Some nice banana. And Trent, is this portion for one animal or both of them? So this is actually just a single portion um, of one of two feedings it would get a day. Okay. Uh, so this is going to be uh, for basically what we call our PM diet or uh, what do you think of as dinner for these animals. Okay. Uh, we use a lot of yams here at the zoo. Uh, these birds are going to get it cooked a little bit soft. Naturally in the wild, hornbills will use some soft food items as well as mud, a couple different things actually create um, a covering over their nest cavity where the female actually gets sealed inside the log and then the male would actually feed it. Uh, and one of the main components in the wild for rhino hornbills is figs. So we provide some soaked, chopped up figs for them as well. And then lastly, this is where the Missouri comes in to play. We're going to feature two different commercial diets that have been formulated for the rhinoceros hornbills. One is our Missouri Zoo Life bird gel that we feed. And then this brightly colored one as well. This is our Missouri Zoo Life softbill pellet. And 
one of the things that we like to do with a lot of our animals here, um, as you notice, is we just fully incorporate all the diet. Keepers or the kitchen staff are going to go in, incorporate it, mix it, and offer it in a combined mix. This uh, prevents the birds from, or not just the birds, but any of the animals from picking out individual components of the food. That way we try to get them a nice, well-rounded portion of the diet. Trent, do you have the gel in the powder form? Yes. So the Missouri gel does not come all nicely cubed up or anything. So this is a, a product that comes in uh, a powdered form, um, and then it's super easy to mix. Um, as you know, it comes. Uh, you take the dry formulation, uh, mix it with some hot water, stir it. You can refrigerate it like we do here. We make about uh, one to two days worth uh, that we keep in the fridge. Uh, for larger batches, you can actually freeze it and then access it later thaw it and stuff. Uh, but here at the zoo, uh, because we go through so much of it, we like to make it fresh. Nice, quick, easy preparation for our animals. Yeah, we offer many of our gel diets um, for different species. And like Trent said, they come in a powder form, very easy to mix. You can keep in the refrigerator for a week um, or freeze it uh, for a month. But it's a good tool, tool um, if you need to add enrichment to any of the diets or if you ever a need to add medication, it's a good vehicle also. Uh, it's very palatable because of the moisture inside the gel. Yeah, yeah, that was one thing I was going to touch on as well. Uh, the formulation between the gel and the soft bill is really similar, uh, but we found here at the zoo the birds definitely have a preference for the gel, so we try to offer a little bit of both. Thankfully, uh, at this time we don't have any health issues with them. It doesn't need to be medicated at this time, uh, but we have offered up uh, gel diets with medical uh, medicine in it for tamarind species. We also utilize the gel formulations for some of our aquatic turtles. Again, the palatability of it, the ability to introduce other feed ingredients to either incorporate additional nutrition or medication as needed works out really well. And the soft bill dye is this extruded yellow particle you see in the mix. Uh, it's a very special diet because it's formulated for birds that are sensitive to iron. So we test ingredients, we test final products to make sure the level of iron doesn't exceed um, their, their limits on, on what they can take for this nutrient. Yes, yeah, definitely. Iron sensitivity is very important in uh, several species of birds, especially in toucan species, um, like our toco toucans that we have here at the zoo, which also get a very similar diet along with the uh, Missouri softbill as well. Very well. Um, so prior to this broadcast, we had uh, received some of your questions from home, and we had some of the questions here today. And like I said previously, if we can't answer today uh, at our live broadcast, we will go through every single question we receive on our Missouri Facebook page and answer them. So Jamie asked, how many zoo diets are created in the kitchen each day here at Santa Barbara Zoo? Um, like I mentioned earlier, we, on a daily basis, prepare about 275 diets every single day. Uh, what I consider a diet here at the zoo would be an individual bowl of food. Uh, so this would basically be one diet, so each individual hornbill would get two diets a day. Um, and the reason we count it that way is not every animal here at the zoo gets two diets a day or three diets a day. Um, some animals will even get less. Some animals might only eat once a week or even less. And no, we're not trying to be mean here at the zoo. Uh, what we're referring to would be the range of species that we have from our reptiles where a lot of our snake species or crocodilians might have limited um, access to food due to basically the weather, the time of the year, so it's really going to vary on it. Um, as I mentioned, those animals will be eating a lot less, which is a natural way that they're going to consume food, up to our otters, our lot of our primate species, they're going to be eating about three diets a day. So, wow. but uh, two, 275 diets is on average, how many do we have to make each day? Are you able to prepare them on the same day, or do you do some prep the day before to be able to deliver all these diets? Yeah. So due to our size, we can prepare most of them the day of. There are a handful of diets that we prepare um, basically for the early morning, the breakfast feed, the night before. Um, but to make sure that we provide uh, quality foods that haven't been exposed to um, any sort of contamination or anything by being chopped, cut up, or anything like that, especially things like the bananas, one nice and fresh, right. we try to do it the day of. Wow. It keeps us very busy. Yes, absolutely. So we have another question from Sarah. She wants to know what is the most challenging animal to feed here at Santa Barbara Zoo? Um, you know, what is the most challenging? Thankfully, we don't have too many animals here that are uh, that challenging to feed. We definitely see a lot of almost individual 
preferences between animals. We see that a lot in some of our smaller primate species, our uh, golden line tamarins. Uh, in our collection, we currently have about nine animals, and we definitely see this one would prefer grapes, or this one's going to prefer bananas. Um, and we try to accommodate to a reason. Um, and sometimes diets need to be manipulated a little bit to encourage animals to consume their food a little bit better. Um, that can be a challenge with the commercial diets, but thankfully, uh, most of them are uh, designed specifically for that animal, so there's very little manipulation that needs to go into consuming it. So that is a good point that Trent mentioned, um, manipulating diets to be more easily acceptable by the animals, and this is something that uh, you guys at home uh, can probably get some tips from Santa Barbara Zoo, because sometimes when offering high fiber diets and low starch, diets that are more in line with uh, what they would eat in the wild, not necessarily are the most palatable options, so some animals tend to prefer animal uh, diets that are a little bit higher in sugar or starch just because they are more palatable, like us. We like donuts and bacon, yeah. and if I could choose that from a palatability standpoint, definitely. But um, what are the tricks that you can do um, to have an, uh, uh, an animal eat, uh, or at least transition to a healthier diet? Oh, yes, definitely. Um, I would have to say one of the biggest cases that we've been involved with on trying to basically convince an animal to consume a little bit healthier diet would be our giant ant eaters. I'm sure not many viewers at home have giant ant eaters, but uh, similar methods and theories can be in place where um, we have a, the wonderful Missouri insectivore diet that is pretty much a staple for all giant ant eaters. Um, it is, as uh, Eliza mentioned, it's a very, it's a dry, commercially made pelleted food. Um, it does a great job of mimicking the natural uh, nutritional requirements for giant ant eaters. Uh, being an insectivore, it's going to require lots of protein, lots of fiber, and a low amount of fat in that. Um, so just thinking about that at home as you're talking about with humans, a high fiber, um, high protein but low fat diet might not be very palatable, not, might not taste very good. But one of the tricks of giant ant eaters is actually just adding water to it. Giant ant eaters not having any teeth need a nice soft food, and that's why the insectivores it's a very small pelleted type of food. Uh, excuse me. So with the giant ant eater diet, by increasing the water, you can actually dilute the nutrition a little bit. So it's and you can also get some fecal uh, abnormalities. So basically, it's uh, not designed to be fed as a almost like an oatmeal consistency. Right. So we introduced it slowly with the water. And basically, over the weeks, we gradually just reduced the amount of water in it. Uh, so it could be the same trick on getting a, a finicky bird to maybe eat is incorporate some additional almost treats or so with the animal and slowly reduce those amount of treats until they convert over. Uh, a lot of people, if you have birds at home that are eating a seed diet, which isn't really ideal for most birds, you incorporate the commercial diet and a slow transition can successfully transition over to those um, much healthier commercial diets. Yes. Um, well, we have several herbivores here at the zoo, uh, including our western lowland gorillas, our Asian elephants, our giraffes, sheep. So all those animals are technically vegans, eating primarily, uh, you know, grass-based diets or grain-based diets, things like that. Um, but in regards to any other animals, where if you're talking a vegan recipe for like a large felid, like a lion, or even something more of an omnivore ranging from possums to foxes, we do not have vegan diets. Um, a vegan diet might be a general trend for humans, but here at the zoo, we like to actually feed a naturalistic diet. You cannot have a carnivore that's gonna consume like, tofu or anything like that. These animals are designed to consume meat, um, and so that's the direction that we have to feed these animals to meet their nutritional requirements. how many different Missouri products do we utilize? Yep. Um, might not be happy with the answer of a lot at home, but um, it's around 36, I believe, is the last time that we counted. So we use quite a bit of Missouri diets. Um, and the reason that we use quite a bit of Missouri diets is we have these different formulations that are specifically geared towards species. So we feed about 
four different types of primate diets. So the different primates that we have here at the zoo each get a different specifically formulated Missouri diet. We have Missouri diets, as I mentioned earlier, for our insectivores like our giant anteaters, um, our bird species, and the list goes on and on. And we do have a handful of other um, commercial products made from other companies as well to fill in some of those gaps. But um, yeah, as I mentioned, 30 odd something Missouri products here at the zoo. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, one thing that I want to point out before we move to our next question is where um, Trent keeps all the diets. So you're going to see he, uh, see here on the lower side underneath the bench, uh, there are these totes. They keep the package um, of each product, and that's very important uh, for folks at home. That will have the lock call number, uh, and the lock call number will also translate to manufacturing date and expiration date. So Santa Barbara Zoo always keeps track of, of their current, you know, what bags are open and lock called. So if you need to look back at any of those products, uh, they can track that. So that's um, very important at zoos, and I would suggest doing the same at home, keeping the, the package of the product you're feeding. So Tiffany, moving on to the next question, uh, wants to know how do you prepare uh, marmoset food here at Santa Barbara Zoo? Uh, so here at Santa Barbara Zoo, we uh, don't specifically have any marmosets. We do have members of the Calatricon family, which are the small little New World primates. Uh, here at Santa Barbara Zoo, we primarily have quite a few gold lion tamarins, as I mentioned. We have a wonderful little uh, breeding family group of them and a couple of uh, non-breeding individuals as well here at the zoo. Um, so being a New World primate, they get uh, two commercially made foods. We feed the Missouri, you might need to help me with this name, the Missouri Heat Resistant High Fiber Diet. Yes. Uh, basically because we are in a zoological setting and uh, in beautiful Santa Barbara, our, our uh, gold lion tamarins have outside exhibits uh, where it can get a little bit warm in the summer. So even this gel diet exposed out inside there stays nice and firm and is a, a staple product. Um, as I mentioned, it's also a nice high fiber diet, a low fat um, diet for the, the primates. Um, and then we also use another commercial canned food uh, specifically formulated again for small primates. Um, and the reason why we offer two different ones is they can be kind of picky. So we found even within the individual family group, some of them will kind of prefer one over another. And sometimes throughout the year, we actually have to kind of rotate the ratio of which one we feed. But throughout the year, it's usually about an equal ratio of 50-50. Um, and then like most of our animals, they also get supplemented with a little bit of fresh produce as well. And of course, uh, a couple of insects as well. Very well. This diet that Trent mentioned, our Caltrich uh, heat stable diet, is um, great for temperatures. Uh, Santa Barbara is very mild throughout the year. It's sunny, it can get warm, but there are other states that get even warmer. So if you prepare, when, pre when you prepare gels at zoos or at home, um, keep in mind that, you know, they will last I would re remove and replace daily. I wouldn't leave the gel out for more than a day and try to cut out what they would readily eat. Um, so we are here, we have the next question from uh, Kevin. Who's Chadwick's? So what is, <laughs> what is Chadwick's favorite meal? Okay, so uh, for those who are not from Santa Barbara, uh, that's why you're not gonna recognize <laughs> the animal Chadwick. Uh, so, um, Kevin, who uh, obviously is a fan, hopefully a member of the Santa Barbara Zoo, uh, Chadwick is our African lion here. Uh, so Chadwick's favorite meal, uh, like most big cats or all big cats, he's a carnivore. So uh, we find we primarily feed a horse-based diet here at Santa Barbara. Um, and the reason we actually feed a horse-based diet is it is a low-fat product, high in protein, which is a requirement for carnivores. Um, it's also been nutritionally balanced with vitamins, minerals, proper amino acids for carnivores like Chadwick, our lion. Uh, we have also introduced a couple of um, treats, if you will, to his diet to actually kind of help recreate more naturalistic feeding tendencies. Uh, so we also feed them various bones as well for him. And that kind of helps with the chewing action, uh, helps keep proper, nice, healthy teeth, kind of like you would feed a, a dog a, a bone to chew on or a greeny type uh, dental product. Um, so Chadwick will also get um, occasional rabbits, and we've actually just begun feeding out um, larger carcasses, actually lamb and beef carcasses. Um, and all these products that I've mentioned, the rabbits, the, um, the lamb, the beef products, um, the carcasses and stuff, this is a, a general trend to a more naturalistic feeding strategy, 
These are all animals that have been raised uh, in a, a farm type setting, the same way that you would consume rabbit or, um, sorry, at home most people consume beef products, chicken products, anything like that. These are animals that have been raised as a food product. We get them in uh, frozen, and that's a little bit safer for the animals. It has a less risk of parasites for them or disease transmission. I can also store a larger quantity of frozen food versus having it actually raised with some sort of animal. So anything here at the zoo that gets fed an actual meat product, and that ranges from penguins consuming fish to all of our snakes and crocodilians consuming fish and other uh, rodent prey, we all feed that. Comes in frozen, we thaw it out, and then we feed it to our animals. Very well. Our next question is from Peter. What is the hardest meal to prepare? Ooh, the hardest meal. You know, I have been at this job for quite a while that I don't know if there's anybody that's quite a hard animal to feed. Um, you know, thankfully we have great part partners like Missouri can help uh, do the, the, the hard, you know, part of the job of actually doing the nutritional formulation. So a lot of our di uh, diets actually, they're not that hard to actually prepare. Um, it comes down more to the animals that might be a little finicky with everything. Um, for those at home who have parrots at home, just like here at the zoo, we have a, a large number of macaws and cockatoos. They are definitely among the finickiest of eaters. Uh, we recently just acquired some beautiful caiman lizards. This is a South American lizard, it's highly aquatic. And they have a unique diet that consists of a lot of snails, crayfish, mollusks, things like that. And they can be a little finicky as well. Um, but thankfully we have access to some nice commercial diets like the Missouri ones. Um, and then being a zoological setting as well, we also uh, have access to a lot of these other food items that we can uh, get for finicky eaters like our caiman lizards. Very well, and here in Santa Barbara Zoo, they have an amazing kitchen. Um, they you, there's a big window here to my left that um, if you're a visitor, you can stop by and see their um, uh, food preparation. So if you haven't had a chance to visit Santa Barbara Zoo, I'll definitely recommend stopping by and peeking on trend through the window. Um, so our last question today here at our live Facebook page at Santa Barbara Zoo is from Lynn. It's a very important question because she uh, concerned about diabetes in primates. So diabetes has become common in primates in managed care. And she wants to know what's the healthiest uh, biscuit option, commercial food option out there. Um, like us uh, humans, diabetes in, in primates is it's a true concern. And a few years back, Missouri developed a diet called Missouri Primate LS. The LS stands for low starch, low sugar, and low sodium. So in partnership with uh, another zoo institution, we tested um, biscuit to be a vehicle for minerals and vitamins that would balance out the fresh produce and fruits that we eat every day. If you remove the biscuit from their diets and only feed fresh produce, the research that was done showed that um, the diet wasn't meeting the primate's nutrient requirements. At the same time, we want to stay away from starch items um, to prevent diabetes, obesity, and, and health problems. Um, so the primate ALS uh, really came as a solution for uh, to prevention for diabetes. There are two types of primate LS, primate banana, it's a smaller biscuit, uh, primate cinnamon, it's a larger biscuit, and we did trials with different flavors, and those were the two um, most popular ones. Oh, and we have it right here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, thankfully, uh, here at the Santa Barbara Zoo, we do feed uh, some of the Missouri LS products, so as Eliza just mentioned, this is the low starch cinnamon formulation, and we also have to have the banana formulation. So if you have a larger, smaller primate, uh, we have lots of different varieties for it. When we did the trial, we found out that the smaller primates prefer the banana flavor and the larger primates prefer the cinnamon. So that's why things are today. They have a very, uh, actually similar exact formulation, just different in flavor. And when you're talking about diabetes and, and having that in mind, I would also consider all the enrichment items and everything you're feeding out to your animals. Star, uh, fruits are very uh, considered very healthy, right? Because we uh, we see that for our diet, but they're fairly different from the fruits that the animals will eat in the wild. So we selected our fruits for our human consumption to be um, juicy and sweet, uh, which is great for 
for our palate, but it has more sugar and less fiber compared to the fruits found in the wild. So I would have a look in the entire diet um, when you're, you're offering to your primates at home and at other zoos institutions uh, to make sure it's balanced out, it's complete, and it has all the nutrients that they need, and it's also balanced. At Missouri.com, we offer a PDF, it's called our spec sheet for all our diets. Um, so you can access from anywhere. And there you're gonna find not only the guaranteed analysis that will show protein uh, levels um, and, and, uh, and fat and, and, and all the, the, the things you see on the package, but you also see the breakdown of what amino acid compose these proteins, what are the, vi the fiber uh, content, what's the, uh, vitamins and minerals, and you're going to see the starch content. The starch on the primate LS diets are less than 8%. So all this uh, information uh, is, has been historically, historically available for zoos because they use that to balance um, their diet when, when preparing. So all, all this food prep that Trent showed us today, um, these are weighed and measured. They he just didn't chop some fruit. There are some calculations. Um, and that information is also available to you uh, at home, so just go to our website and download um, uh, our spec sheets. And if you have any further questions, you can email us at info at Missouri.com and we'll be happy to answer. So, well, we're not as cute as, uh, what's your lion's name? Oh, Chadwick. Chadwick or yeah. April, the giraffe. So yeah. we're going to go outside and show who's waiting for us. Yeah, uh, we could come to the Santa Barbara Zoo and post a Facebook Live session with Missouri here without actually seeing some actual real life animals. Uh, everyone here is about nutrition and how it is to feed animals, but I think to take a glimpse at some of uh, the beautiful city throne Santa Barbara is it. So uh, I'm gonna ask my camera person, we all ready? All right, so you guys are gonna follow me outside and we're gonna take a look to see what else we have at Santa Barbara Zoo. So as I mentioned earlier, we are uh, in Santa Barbara Zoo, beautiful Santa Barbara, California, here at the zoo. We are nestled on about 30 acres here at the zoo. We feature over 500 exotic animals. And represented about 115 species. So I'm sure some of you might be able to see off in the distance some of uh, the animals that we're going to have to check out here. So here we are again. And Come on over, Liza, you can check out. So here today we actually have some of our Chilean flamingos here. <laughs> flamingos here. Uh, that we like to actually call our flamingo. These are some individual birds that we um, had hand raised. And we have our, our, our wonderful uh, Santa Barbara Zoo bird team out here who's uh, been nice enough to bring them out and uh, bring us up for us. Uh, unfortunately, I am not as familiar with the ages of these guys, um, but... They're just over uh, four months is our youngest, and then our oldest right up front here is just over eight months. All right, so to give you guys a better idea at home, uh, Sarah over there has informed me. So our ages are, the youngest one's about four months up to eight months of age. And you probably at home are noticing the lack of coloration on these birds. Um, and that is because these are uh, juvenile birds. They will develop the more familiar pink pigmentation um, as they get older. Um, and that um, the pigmentation is normally found in the various crustaceans that would eat in the wild. So here at the zoo, we do feed these guys a flamingo uh, complete diet, which is made by Missouri, which has the additional uh, pigmentation needed. So these birds will become that more familiar pink as they get a little bit older. Well, this is all the time we have today. Thank you for joining us at home. Thank you, Trent, oh. for opening the doors to Red Lee Animal Kitchen and for your staff bringing out the animals. Um, if you haven't had a chance to visit Santa Barbara Zoo, California is beautiful and Santa Barbara Zoo is amazing, so I'll definitely recommend stopping by. Oh, well, thank you, Eliza, and thank you to Missouri, and thank you all for uh, tuning in and watching our uh, Facebook Live feed here today. Thank you.